uh, thank you for tuning in to the Biodesign Competition webinar hosted by the Biodesign and Innovations Committee. So this year we had eight brilliant teams tackle various challenges in global health IR. They will each be speaking briefly about the problem they have chosen to address and the solutions they have come up with. So we are joined today by our guest speaker, John Brumbley, Director of Business Development from Cook Medical, who will be speaking to us today about indus the industry perspective to the development of new technology and innovations. So please welcome John. I'm turn this over to you. Hi, everyone. Hello. My name is. So we just need you to share your screen again. Okay. There. Great. Uh, thanks for asking me to uh, talk this evening. Uh, my name is John Brown Levy. Uh, I've been with Cook for 37 years in various roles, and uh, now I'm a director in product development for the vascular division, uh, which includes uh, peripheral arterial disease, embolization, and interventional products, meaning uh, like drainage and non-vascular, uh, like biopsy drainage and things like that. Oops. How can I advance? I am not sure about that. Okay. Oh, great. Right there. So uh, this gentleman is Sven Seldinger. And Sven was a radiologist in Sweden and published the first Seldinger technique in the Attica Radiologica in 1953. And he really revolutionized the industry. Before that, catheters were placed through needles. And um, they had some issues associated with that in that a lot of times the, the catheter was cut in the vasculature and uh, it floated to uh, the right atrium and then the pulmonary artery. So what he did is he wrote about putting a, a wire guide or a guide wire through the needle and then a catheter uh, over the wire guide. So you withdraw the needle, the wire is sticking outside of the vessel, and it could be any orifice, uh, could be a, a non-vascular uh, entity as well, or place in your body, and then you'd place the catheter over the, uh, the wire guide and then withdraw the wire guide. And uh, this is the first year uh, that Bill incorporated his business. So this was in 1963. And this happens to be in the RSNA at uh, one of the hotels in Chicago. And he has his wares there. He, it's showing the, uh, the burner that he used to pull catheters and that has wire guides and catheters and various tubings. And uh, Bill had some, he was a medic in the army and then he, was a engineer as well. And he had a business in uh, uh, Chicago with a fraternity brother of his. And he decided that he needed to uh, get out of the Chicago area. He had been uh, a student at Northwestern before. And so he settled down in Southern Indiana and his wife is from Southern Indiana. And he started a business at Cook Incorporated. During this meeting in 1963, uh, he ran into this gentleman, uh, which is Charles Stoddard. And he, uh, it's a funny story. Uh, he wanted to borrow the Bunsen burner and, and Bill's catheters. And Bill wanted to know what he wanted to do with them. And he said, well, I want to play around and, and make my own catheters. So ben, Bill, uh, lent him the, uh, the materials, and the next morning, uh, Charles brought the materials back and put 10 perfectly made catheters, and Bill ended up selling them at the meeting, and um, they talked a little bit later on, and Bill ended up having a lifelong 
uh, friendship with Charles Dodder and Charles brought a lot of products uh, our way in the early years. So we started out with three products in 1963 is basically, this is actually uh, Charles Dodder in the background talking with Bill, uh, needles, catheters, and wire guides. Uh, now, we, uh, we've grown a little bit since then, and uh, we have two divisions, uh, 16,000 products, uh, 10,000 people, we're in 135 countries, and we manufacture on three continents. Um, whoops. And uh, if you break down our, our sales, 44% uh, are in the U.S., 6% uh, are in Latin America or Canada, 28% uh, are in Europe, and then 22% are in APAC. And this is our headquarters now. And so if you look at kind of where we were 56, 57 years ago with three simple products, We've, we've evolved and we actually ballooned up to about 200,000 different uh, SKUs or products. But the medical industry is a highly regulated area. And um, those regulations uh, include the FDA, the EU MDR, which is the new system that Europe has gone to instead of just a CE mark. And just to delve into a little complexity here, um, I'll just leave this slide on. So it used to be the easiest market to go to market in Europe because you just needed uh, a CE mark. Starting this May and June I, with the EU MDR, to get a new device approved, you're going to have to have clinical uh, evidence. And so you have to run a clinical trial uh, to get a regulatory approval. Um, and then whereas you have the FDA, the EU MDR, you basically have regulatory agencies in China, basically uh, Japan, every country has their own regulations or a portion of that regulations. So um, what happens is it's becoming a lot more costly to get a product approved. Uh, another area is physician involvement. Whereas before we just talked to the Charles Dodders or the Gian Turcos or the Sid Wallaces for embolization coils. Now you have the Sunshine Act and there's a very, uh, specific uh, compliance code that we have to follow. Um, and it's a, it's a little bit more difficult to work with physicians and actually get contracts with physicians because if you want to talk to a physician about uh, a, a product and there is going to be some uh, negotiation you'll have to record those negotiations and um, any exchange of transfer has to be recorded in the Sunshine Act. Another area of complexity is reimbursement. So reimbursement is very important so that medical companies or, or basically anyone could get paid. Uh, and if you come out with a product that doesn't have reimbursement, it's going to be more going to be slower for the uptake of its use. Uh, if it's more expensive than currently what's on the market, but it doesn't offer any increased reimbursement, that's going to impede the adoption in the market. So um, these are things that it, you, should, you should think about when you come up with a new product is, okay, how is that product or service going to be remunerated either by the company, by yourself, by the entity that you're working with. Um, and so that's going to be very important upfront. And I'll talk about that in just a couple minutes.
So this is just a run of the mill uh, book that talks about new products and accelerating the process. And I've re uh, I always refer back to this uh, book just to make sure that I'm covering all the bases. And I'm going to just have a couple slides that I'm going to use from this book. Um, and that is where we're talking right now, there's, there's basis, basically about five stages to new product development. And I'm going to concentrate in the first and the second stage in that it really talks about your assessment in the first stage and kind of getting that fuzzy feasibility. In stage two, you need to really hone in those skills and look at how you test the product, the competitive technologies out there, are, is or, or are there patents associated with it? And then uh, a preliminary and a pretty detailed preliminary market assessment. And then once you get past these first two gates, then you go into more of the engineering. So I'm going to concentrate on the, the middle portion, but always know that there are about five or six uh, gates or stages that you have to progress through. Uh, again, going in that first stage or the second stage, you're going to look at uh, scenario generate, ger generation, what are the revenues, uh, the voice of customers, probably uh, the most important, and then a uh, user analysis. And then what you need to do is the more people you talk to, you need to jot down what their feedback is and then continuously move it through a cycle. So you're honing in on what that value proposition is for the product, the users, uh, the people that are going to be paying for this, and you need to, to really button those questions up that people are going to ask you. Uh, this is a little bit more detailed on those first two gates and how those are used as far as assessing, identifying, and proving the product idea. And this is where you're going to be playing a big role or a marketing person in that you really know this area, you're the expert, right? Um, and you, you need to be able to look kind of 360 degrees and identify uh, what those user needs are and communicate that to what you're going to be delivering as far as a product or service after that. And then um, this is the area on, on gate two, but you know that once it goes and it's accepted um, and it starts taking form and it goes through uh, Uh, you identify the product and it goes from the um, product freeze, then it goes into development and then V and V or validation and uh, verification. And there's a whole list of uh, Uh, um, stages that engineers and then subsequently regu uh, regulatory or uh, people with clinical trials uh, have to identify prior to a full launch. And so I've just kind of jotted down some cheat sheets on things that you should think about once you get to these points. And then are, are there similar products in the market? If so, what makes this product different or unique? And what is that value proposition? Is there something that's 
unique about this product that you think should be patented. Um, and then I'll be talking about this in a, in a second. If it is, um, how do you how do you proceed with that? And it's really in how you get it commercialized. So if you have this idea, you have a couple choices. You can either uh, do it yourself uh, or reach out to an angel investor or a venture, venture capitalist. Um, one of the easiest ways for you, uh, because you're going through training, is to partner with the university. And they will help you, especially with the IP um, going forward with this and uh, look at what else is out there and do a patent search. And then uh, you could partner with a, another company. A couple more slides here, so I, and I know I have to be brief this evening. Um, so once you get to design freeze, um, you really want to have early feasibility testing uh, even before design freeze and have a prototype. Uh, you could have animal testing before design freeze or after define, design freeze. And then that's the how, where, and when. And you have to ask what's required to be. And then these are the things you need to have kind of in your background. What is the regulatory pathway? Is it going to be a 510K or do you need to do a clinical trial? And what is the expected development time? If you need to do a clinical trial, um, you need to identify is it what you need to deliver with that clinical trial. And then think about what product improvements could be made. And then how will you proceed with these improvements and share those improvements? And then these, this is more big picture stuff, but um, what you really need to do is identify the need uh, and what those clinical inputs are. Uh, engineering will pick this up and they will scope a design, develop it, test it, uh, verify and validate, and then do a um, product design and failure mode analysis. Uh, again, regulators, you, you need to determine if it's going to be a 510K or if it's going to be an IDE PMA. If it's going to be an IDE PMA for a medical device, it's pretty much you're spending probably in excess of $5 million just with that clinical uh, study. And then uh, depending on which avenue you go, either with your own company, VC, or other, you'll, you'll need to uh, uh, have a relationship with clinical research organization uh, and then develop and implement the uh, the studies. And then again, at the in the back of your mind, you should always think about reimbursement. So how what how is it going to be reimbursed, but more importantly, what is the current method of reimbursement? and then how does this product uh, measure up with the current method. Are there improvements that you could demonstrate and then how you would go about um, increasing the reimbursement for the products? Um, I left a, uh, our mission statement at, at Cook and this is one of the things that you want to see what's the current culture of the organization that you're working with. Is it more uh, patient valued or are, are people just in for revenue? And then you have to ask yourselves, what is my involvement and, and how could I team up with this uh, entity to either create a better product or, um, or kind of fit 
or gel with the um, the entity and you know combine forces to to um, really use your uh, talents and skills as far and uh, market insight for this product or service. So um, you know this is our mission statement. Mission statements are important and. Uh, you should just make sure that you have the right uh, organization that you're working with. And that's my presentation. All right, thank you so much, Sean, for sharing a little bit about the history as well as your insight. Uh, so next we will have each of the teams sharing a little bit uh, about what they've been working on. So. All right, Marley. Hello, uh, let me get my PowerPoint up. <clears throat> Thank you, John, for that introduction uh, to uh, interventional radiology and the history there. Um, can you can you see the screen appropriately here? Yes. All right, great. Uh, so my name is Marley Wyndham Herman. I'm an MD MBA student at Yale. And our project uh, delivers a reusable core needle biopsy device uh, at low cost. When we looked into this problem, um, and just for a sense of scale, first, in the U.S., there's 327 million people, and there's about 5,000 interventional radiologists. Africa, a country of 1.3 billion, and we take, for example, Nigeria, the wealthiest country in Africa, uh, with a population of 200 million, they only have five interventional radiologists. Tanzania, 57 million, zero interventional radiologists. Um, so we estimate there's about a billion people without access to core needle biopsy. Uh, we have a partner program at Amunbili Hospital. It's an IR residency program. Talking to them revealed a need, uh, an unmet need for reusable biopsy equipment. They have a reimbursement program they're trying to set up, but they struggle with the high cost of disposable biopsy equipment and the high upfront cost of reusable biopsy equipment. This is our team. Um, we've assembled a pretty diverse team. Uh, we have medical students, myself and David. We've uh, recruited uh, business students uh, with backgrounds in uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, biomedical engineering, and finance. And we have a team of uh, physicians, uh, both here at Yale and in Tanzania. Our solution uh, is a reusable core needle biopsy gun manufactured from autoclavable, sterilizable plastic. It's lightweight and radio transparent also, so it allows easy use even in a delicate fluoroscopically guided procedures or CT guided biopsies. It would be a, compatible with a range of coaxial biopsy needle systems. Uh, and then after use, the needle can be removed and the device can be autoclaved and restocked. The uh, real value of this device is in its low cost. Here you can see a breakdown of materials. These are really simple materials, polypropylene rod and metal springs. Um, and our manufacturing costs and shipping costs that we've estimated for a total unit cost of about $43.25. Uh, are we certain about these costs? No, these are estimates that are based on our research, but if these costs do move in any direction, likely the material costs, for example, would go down at scale. And for the, the cost included here is the cost for a sink, buying a single polypropylene rod. Um, the manufacturing and shipping costs we'd expect, uh, they might go up or down, but we do believe that this $43 value is is a decent ballpark. Um, and we can see that with our comparables here. Uh, we have a plastic disposable, metal reusable, and our plastic reusable biopsy device. Um, this is a, based on a, a cost model that we did based on the Muambili biopsy volumes over 10 years. You can see um, at the upfront cost, we modeled for the reusable devices, we modeled an initial purchase of five devices, and there's a staggering difference between the upfront costs for these metal reusable and our plastic reusable devices. This can be a prohibitive cost for a lot of global IR programs that are trying to start up. Uh, oh, did I lose you? Yeah, you did. Are you able to share your screen again? Um, I don't see an option for it now. It just disappeared. I can try changing the screen away from you and then back to you again. Let's see. And then... Yep. 
Here you go. Great. Can you see this? You can see it again. Yep. Great. Okay. So I was talking about the uh, the upfront cost differences. Um, we also see a difference in um, the versatility of the device. So the metal reusable devices, these are heavier devices. They're um, they're obviously metal, so they don't uh, they're not really used in a lot of situations uh, like CT guided biopsies, more delicate soft tissue biopsies. Uh, over 10 years, we use the same uh, needle per, per per sorry per procedure needle cost um, for both the metal and plastic reusable devices, and you can see our device still outperforms the others on cost savings at 10 years. So what are the next steps we need to take to basically bring this uh, device and deliver it to global IR programs? Right now we're in the prototyping stage doing, we need to do proof of concept modeling, we need to do materials experimentation um, and some in-house testing with that. And um, importantly, we need to do an IP landscape search, contract with a search firm to do that and then work with that material with um, an IP law firm to develop um, a protection around this idea. That's gonna be probably the majority of our funding ask at this stage. Once we have that, we can move to this production stage where we would contract with a full service product design and development company to do professional prototyping, pilot production, and their own biocompatibility and sterilization testing um, as required by regulators. Um, the funding requirements for this, we've seen a quote down to $50,000 up and it can range higher. And uh, we put an estimate there for that. Once we've done that, um, we move to the next stage. This is a little bit harder for us to forecast now. Um, we talked in our the last presenter talked about some various options we might take um, in terms of partnerships for this, um, but we can say in terms of regulatory approval, we do believe that this will have a swift track to um, to approval, um, likely as a class one or possibly class two device. It has substantial equivalence to current uh, legally marketed devices. Um, and just uh, some closing remarks on this. Uh, I believe that IR is poised to make an enormous impact on the lives of millions of patients globally. Um, and we hope that with this device, we can lower at least one barrier that stands in the way of making that possible. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. So next up, we'll have Jimmy. <laughs> Uh, is it showing? Yep. And uh, are you able to hear me? Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Jimmy George. I'll be representing my team from UTMB. So a little background for our prompt. Um, developing our programs need ways to help track items that have been donated and then this donor established IR programs need ways to track the items that they gave out and need to be returned. And alongside this, equipment tracking itself is a major issue that affects healthcare workers. This involves a loss of equipment, loss of time, and less of quality of patient care as shown by studies. The market itself is an $8 billion market and many companies have moved in. However, the cost can be high, ranging in the thousands per year. Um, and often companies move in from other spaces, such as warehouse spaces, and try to adapt that to a healthcare setting which often leads to a lack of a natural interface. In our research, uh, competitors have shown three major components, a centralized database, trackers such as QR codes, RFID, wall mounts, or Bluetooth, and then scanners and interface to access the information. So our focus was to make a product that is accurate, cost-effective, and user-friendly. It should have a simple design, as we found that competitors make products that often have too much customization or options that confuse workers. And our goal was to use more cost-effective components to make some more affordable, so we wouldn't reach that $1,000 uh, price cost. And these improvements to the interface can be made as, as a system being used through an iterative process. What we mean by that is we would work with our, our own iron department to find out what features are most necessary starting from a skeleton framework. So for the basics, we will have an app, as our competitors do, using the MIT App Inventor, which is a very simple interface and I've used it before and it saves on cost, is functional and works on multiple flat platforms. So if you have an iOS or an Android device, it should be fine. PHP would be used to make the website and SQL database would be used to store all the information. This again saves on costs and has been used by large companies such as Yahoo and Dell. And the QR codes themselves are pretty simple. They've already been in use and people know how to use them. So this should minimize how much training is required. So for differentiation, so some basic costs that we'd have to cover up front. Of course, printers, these can vary based on how much you need. Printer roles for the QR codes. Host ones would be the site used to host our website and the SQL database. 
And then of course, if we can cover the app and website creation in team, then we should be able to cover that cost. Um, time spent for training and initial setup of materials is something that will be need, to, need to be considered by the department because the nurses or radiology technicians or physicians will have to take time to tag the equipment for the first time use. The interface itself is meant to be designed alongside in our department. That'll be our own department uh, to get rid of as many shiny features as we can. So again, we're starting with a basic home screen and then a way to add in items, look up items, and determine if they need maintenance or not. And this will then start to follow the hospital's innate organization scheme. So implement implementation, we do have this figure on the right, but just to go through it more simply, we start with a QR code that we will tag onto our equipment. The centralized database will record this information with basics such as location, owner, and condition of said equipment. And then the hospital side has access to this, and that means that the donor hospital as well as the hospital receiving equipment have access to the information stated above. And then we can determine if, if there needs to be maintenance, if it can continue to be used after fix, or if it needs to be returned to the home institution for whatever reason they might have. Follow through, of course, we do need to consider for these developing IR programs, wherever they might be, if they have internet access or Wi-Fi and smartphones that are able to use the app that we're working with. And the reability of the QR codes, adequate lighting is necessary, camera quality is essential. And then training, there will need to be some time taken out to make sure that the team knows how to use the QR codes and application and the application and system usage. And we would also need to try to look to see if we could possibly work with SIR reserve members to set this up so we could allow those members to make connections with those developing programs and also at the same time have the experience of seeing what it's like to work in a developing center. An estimated timeline is should be about six months for so two months for software, four months for beta testing, and then of course there might be bumps along the way trying to work with SIR, trying to see how much resource help we can get, but that is our estimated timeline. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. So next up is going to be Navon. Can you see my screen? Yep. All right, thank you everybody. Um, I'm with the Albany Medical College team. Um, our solution is also related to equipment tracking. Uh, we call our product Levigo, uh, cutting edge equipment tracking system. Um, these are just some of the things that we'll be covering today. Um, just starting off with the background problem statement, um, as previously mentioned, organizations like RADAID um, and other like organizations are a nonprofit global health organization that brings radiological services to sites around the world. Um, its mission is to improve and optimize access to medical in imaging um, and radiology in most resource regions of the world for increasing radiology's contribution to global public health initiatives and patient care. So just for scope, here's a map of over 30 countries that RADAID has programs in. Um, and you can imagine that each one of these um, requires a great deal of administrative and logistic organization. So here's just a screenshot example of how RADAID currently tracks its equipment and supplies. Um, it's a spreadsheet that's manually handled. Um, Everything is, uh, all of data entry is manually done and there's um, a lot of room for human error. And you can imagine that um, as you start to develop IR programs at resource poor sites, um, many of these sites will rely on donating equipment um, and this manual cataloging and um, transportation actually by volunteers um, it's going to not just be costly in terms of time, but um, not allow uh, sort of sites to scale up. So as practices have grown, there have been discrepancies that we found um, in equipment availability and demand. Um, so to avoid shortages that impact um, the, availab the availability of equipment and therefore um, procedures, uh, it's important to devise a streamlined digitized system of equipment tracking 
transportation and cattle. So as you can imagine, there are a lot of different stakeholders, uh, humanitarian organizations um, that could benefit from a digitized system like this. Um, obviously, at the end of the day, patients are what matter. Um, industry and partners and hospitals should have a centralized platform to facilitate the donation of equipment. Um, and obviously, volunteers uh, should be able to use this platform to, um, to more easily uh, catalog equipment, bring them to sites that need that equipment, and um, do so in a way that's standardized. So our design process really began with trying to gather data um, to understand the volunteer experience through informational interviews. So this involved you know, talking to physicians who had experience with Rad Aid, radiologists without borders, and other organizations that bring uh, radiology services and devices to research poor nations. So our first um, interviewee brought that spreadsheet that you saw um, currently used, uh, organize all this uh, and shipped to different Rad Aid sites. Um, and this sort of kicked off an iterative process in which um, we kind of summarized uh, the, the different pain points and stakeholders involved with actually just bringing equipment and coordinating volunteers from point A to point B. Um, we were able to sort of continuously refine our understanding of the problem and therefore the solution that it necessitates. Um, so this is just a sort of refined flow diagram depicting um, the different moving parts and stakeholders involved. And as mentioned, um, a lot of the pain points had to do with just uh, eliminating error, eliminating cost, and eliminating time. So what we came up with is a comprehensive data platform. Um, it's an end-to-end -end vehicle. Uh, you know, on one end you have a very user-friendly mobile um, application that's free to download. Uh, it has a built-in barcode scanner capability um, that can be used by volunteers, donors, um, folks at Rad Aid headquarters, where you can scan barcodes, enter in information from drop-down menus, um, and all the inputs from users around the world um, update the total inventory database in real time. Um, so, you know, you can have a real-time view, bird's-eye view of your entire organizational network, what equipment is where, um, and what's needed at different sites. So this app is um, also designed to work in areas with no internet connection. So that's important in developing nations. As soon as you enter Wi-Fi, um, it automatically uploads um, the data into a cloud-based database. Uh, that database is uh, on, built on top of that database is a fully interactive dashboard that allows users to explore that entire uh, RAD-A network. Users can use um, dynamic filters in that dashboard to drill up, see that bird's eye view, see overall trends in equipment supply demand, and quickly identify operational issues, or drill down to individual volunteer site or even individual equipment level. So we have a quick demo um, of, the, of the tool. So let's say you're an interventional radiologist from Albany Medical Center, um, and you're a rad volunteer. You just received a donation from the hospital of a, an ultrasound machine um, that's going to be vital to um, the upcoming trip that you have to the Radid State and a Arusha, Tanzania. So first you'll see the app. You can easily scan that equipment and immediately start inputting information. So we give this a name, ultrasound one, um, you sort it by type, so this is obviously an ultrasound, put an expiration date, which is going to be more relevant to non-durable goods. Um, the site also auto-generates uh, GPS locations, which we'll see later why that's important. Um, you can see where it's coming from, where it's going, the status, whether it's been stocked, shipped, or received, and add any relevant notes to uh, users. For example, it uses X, Y, and Z software. So you just save and close, um, refresh the database, and it'll pop right into this cloud-based server. Um, and as we scroll down, 
you can see that that ultrasound uh, is now in our system um, with updated quantity, which re reflects a real-time inventory. Um, all the updated values, everything that you just saw entered. Um, next, we move to the fully interactive dashboard. So this is filterable. It will start on the left side. Um, you can filter it by the sites that you're interested in. Um, the entire dashboard dynamically filters based on those those filters. You can sort by origin. You can look at just the items that are stocks or shipped um, and sort by different types of equipment that you might be interested in, like catheters, book lines, tubes. Um, the map itself is also filterable. You can see just very quickly how many items there are stocked, um, what are the different statuses of those items, where um, where are those items going to? And when you look at the actual inventory, and as you can see here, the ultrasound is in our database now, you can see that it's coming from Albany going to Arusha. It's been stocked, and there we now have five of them uh, ready for ready for the site. So as you can see, um, hopefully you can see that, you know, this has a lot of different um, users that, that could benefit from using this app. Um, we'd like to tailor this uh, solution to different uh, users like suppliers, volunteers. Um, and as we increase our list of available suppliers, we also see an opportunity to actually create an optimized resource sharing network. So have different hubs around the, around the world that can share resources. So instead of tracking or shipping an ultrasound from Albany to Tanzania, you can, you can ship it from Kenya. Um, over time, we'll gather enough historical data to be able to predict uh, demand and see how consistently um, supply is meeting demand um, and make sure, again, that uh, distance, cost, um, everything is, op is optimized and will allow organizations like RadAid to scale um, the great work that they're doing. So just a couple of acknowledgments of our collaborators. Um, without their insights, this wouldn't have been possible. So huge uh, thank you to um, Dr. Siskin, Dr. Narayan, uh, Dr. Kurt Gill. Um, please feel free to reach out to the team. We welcome feedback and questions and uh, thank you for your time. All right, thank you so much. So next up we have Christopher. Selena. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Christopher Johns. I'm a first year medical student at UT Southwestern. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to present. We title our project DEXT, and our aim is to bridge the gap between patient and provider in the developing world. So, we crafted uh, DEXT with RAD Aid in mind. Um, we've heard a good amount about RADAID tonight, but it's a great nonprofit organization that is dedicated to providing diagnostic and IR care to underprivileged regions like Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, three common procedures performed by RADAID physicians are the placement of uh, cholecystostomy tubes, gastrostomy tubes, and nephrostomy tubes. Uh, the complication rates uh, for these procedures range from 10 to 30 percent depending on the procedure. and um, of course, these complications become much more significant when you don't have easy access to care, like some of the places that Red Aid works in. And even if the complication rates were the same as the United States, uh, in these low resource settings, we'd expect morbidity to be higher due to limited access to quality health care and the difficulty of follow-up in, in rural settings. So with the growth of programs like Red Aid, we have seen an expansion of uh, IR to developing nations. And as IR becomes increasingly clinical in scope, so too does responsibility to follow up with long-term patients. And given the setting that organizations like RADAID operate in, the IR physician is required to take on a larger role in patient care. Uh, and of course, though the service that RADAID provides is much needed, there are significant obstacles to overcome. Uh, in these types of locations, quality healthcare can be sparse and patients in rural environments may have to travel a really large different, uh, distances to receive the care they need. For example, imagine having a life-changing procedure done and then being given responsibilities in your recovery, like in the case of a gastrostomy tube placement, and then being hours away from any contact with your provider. Infrequent visits are unavoidable, unavoidable 
in some cases and a breakdown in communication between patient and provider is possible. So this is where DEX comes in. DEX is a secure SMS-based messaging platform between patient and provider that is used to send IR appointment reminders, medication regimen, and triage complaints by screening for severe complications that require immediate medical attention. Our hope is that this will bridge the gap between the IR physician and the patient, and that by doing so, compliance rates may increase and the complication rate will decrease. The patient, of course, is our primary stakeholder. They have the most to gain and definitely the most to lose. Our hope is that this platform will give them greater confidence in their recovery post-procedure. So as mentioned previously, DEX is an SMS-based patient communication platform. Following the IR procedure, the patient will be educated about the platform and instructed on its use. Pre-selected settings will be in place for the patient according to the procedure that has been performed, and each correspondence will begin with a verification process using a unique patient identifier. We expect the inter interaction to go as followed, and you can kind of follow along with the flowchart here. Depending on the procedure performed, either hours or days from being discharged, the patient will receive an initial text reminding them about upcoming appointments as well as asking if they're having any symptoms and to quantify the severity from one to 10. If their symptoms are quantified as five or greater, they'll be presented with a list of severe symptoms and asked if they're experiencing any of them. If they are, they'll be asked to describe the symptoms and possibly include a picture. For example, if they're concerned about a color of discharge or skin, cha skin changes at an incision site. Now, this description will then be forwarded directly to the IR physician who will respond and decide the treatment plan. If they are not experiencing severe symptoms, they'll be provided with a list of common mild symptoms and asked if they're experiencing those. If they are, they'll be reassured that their symptoms are common and can continue to rest and follow their prescribed regimen. If their symptoms are not found on either the severe symptoms or mild symptoms list, they'll have the option to describe their symptoms. And again, the provider will be notified immediately that a patient has submitted a description. This will allow the provider to review the symptoms, respond, and follow the required course of action. In addition, when a patient has concerns, they'll be able to message the same number and receive a response. It would function almost like a SMS-based patient portal. And on the right, there's an example here of an interaction between patient and the office following the procedure. So SMS-based messaging platforms have been used with great success previously. Uh, we looked at a literature review that was done in 2018 that covered 162 articles regarding text messaging in the healthcare setting. The review found that nearly all SMS reminder studies helped improve patient compliance and attendance. We can also see the application in the global health environment with these studies that, uh, that are shown here, like this one where reminders improved infant vaccination coverage in Guatemala, here, where a hospital in Malawi saved more than 2,000 hours of community health worker time over the course of the study due to better communication between patients and staff, and here, where SMS messaging platform improved delivery outcomes in Zanzibar. The obvious limitation is that all parties involved must have a cell phone without significant restrictions on SMS messaging. And ideally, it would be a smartphone so that you know they could have the uh, picture involvement like mentioned before. Fortunately, as of 2017, about 99% of the developing world had mobile phone subscriptions. While not all have mobile phone messaging capability currently, SMS messaging from providers will still provide significant coverage that has not been seen previously. Furthermore, we anticipate uh, mobile messaging and internet accessibility in low-income nations to only increase as time goes on. Though we mentioned similar platforms being used in the global health environment in the past, none that we have come across are as ambitious in following a patient through recovery as DEX. DEX is intended to be simple, and we believe that simplicity will allow it to be extremely effective and accessible. Given the, altruist, given the altruistic nature of Rad Aid and other similar organizations, our venture uh, is not profit focused. We understand that there will be a cost of initial development and maintenance, but we think it is somewhat minimal. We intend to charge organizations like Rad Aid at the cost of our technology development, maintenance, and implementation. And we expect the decreased morbidity rates associated with the complications will incentivize these organizations to pay the small amount to use our technology. To close, I'd just like to reiterate that our aim is to improve patient compliance a reduced patient's anxiety surrounding the post-operative period, and to reduce the morbidity associated with procedural complications through improved communication between patient and the provider. Uh, thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Um, next up, we have Kevin. Uh, can you see me? Yep. And you can hear me all right? Yep. All right. All right, so good evening. Uh, my name is Kevin Malone, and today I'll be proposing a solution to optimize catheter function for expediated catheter removal. Uh, so this is part of the Global Health Challenge. Uh, we aimed to minimize costs in developing countries and hospitals. So our catheter aimed uh, had three main aims, to have simple and effective collection evacuation, 
to shorten the duration of catheterization and to have a multifunctional purpose. So this is the overall design that we created. Um, so the main features that we're gonna be looking at are the dual lumen, the accessory hole, and the cost effectiveness of the catheter itself. I wanted to first talk about the dual lumen. So looking again at our overall catheter, and we zoom in right here, you can see there's a minor chamber highlighted in green and a major chamber highlighted in white. And we made a 3D model of this, showing the major and the minor chamber. And we based our catheter on the principles of active drainage. So what is active drainage? So it's the concept of using catheters as conduits for the manipulation of collections. This would include irrigation, aspiration, and the me mechanical removal of particles. Uh, so we developed a dual lumen catheter that could both irrigate and aspirate simultaneously. In addition, it has three distal end holes and a pigtail locking mechanism. The catheter also features an accessory hole, and the accessory hole would be able would allow for transcatheter manipulation, so remove particles, biopsy, ablation, uh, drug device device delivery, uh, and it could also allow for visualization, which we'll talk about in the uh, upcoming. So again, this is our device, and if we zoom in right here, you can see the accessory hole at the distal end of the catheter. And we have a little animation for you. So the hole is positioned at the curvature of the catheter. And then in red, you can see that there's an instrument. So this could be used for ablation, for instance. So due to the natural curvature of the catheter, this would allow the instrument to naturally, naturally uh, exit out, say, out of the uh, accessory hole. In addition, we have an inner sheath. Uh, the inner sheath will allow the free movement of the instrument as well. When the catheter is not in use for the, whenever the catheter is not using the accessory hole, the inner sheath would be allowed to uh, cover the accessory hole. Looking at the proximal end of the catheter, uh, we, we have a little area right here that would allow the operator to manipulate the inner sheath. And this is the inside of the catheter, you can see the free movement of the inner sheath. So the accessory hole can also be used for collection cavity visualization. Uh, so during our review of literature, we found a mobile phone based high resolution micro endoscope. Uh, this is the micro endoscope right here. And you, as you can see, the camera diameter is very small. It's about one millimeter. And they, they, they hypothesized that it could be built for about $500 total. So this would allow the camera to be used in uh, third world countries. Uh, we also wanted the catheter to feature cost effectiveness. So decreasing the indwelling catheter time would decrease the amount of infections, which would decrease the hospital stay and decrease the actual cost of the catheter of the hospitalization. Uh, this would be feasible. It would add very little to the actual cost of the catheter. However, it could potentially save thousands of dollars. Uh, the ease of use of the catheter would make the training simple and practical. Uh, for example, in the United States, the American Hospital Association estimates the average cost for hospitalization per day around $2,000. So in the US, they can save around $2,000 a day per day lost. But this is all theoretical, right? Well, we actually developed the catheter inside of our lab. This is here with the trocar, but it could also be used with the Salendigger method or the trocar method. And this is it showing the potential for aspiration and irrigation simultaneously. We actually tested this too. So we used a simulation abscess with highly viscous fluid uh, for our test model. And we tried to use the, uh, the common uh, catheter to aspirate it. We were unable to, however, when we used our catheter design, we were able to completely evacuate the collection, um, the fluid collection with, with irrigation and aspiration combined. We have a five minute video on this if y'all want. Uh, this is our current model, it's pretty good. But who can benefit from this? The answer is everyone. Uh, it's applicable in developing countries, but it could also be used in the first world. So in conclusion, we believe that we have developed a catheter that accomplishes effective collection evacuation, reduces the duration of catheterization, is cost saving, multifunctional, and applicable, applicable globally. Uh, we wanna thank you very much for uh, listening to our presentation. And this is some references we used. All right, thank you very much. So next up we have Larry.
you hear me? Let's see if yes. I okay. Um, let's see. Okay, good. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Joe. I'm a medical student at Wake Forest uh, Medical School. And uh, instead of reading this long title, I'll leave that for your later pleasure in reading. Um, but our need statement really came from the idea that uh, we've identified really critical medical information in interventional radiology's procedure notes. And uh, we believe this information is valuable because it tells a lot about a patient's health journey. Uh, but the issue is that uh, as many of us know, radiology, uh, any pr medical procedure notes can be subjective and the information can be hard to extract. So what we want to do is we want to find a way to unlock that potential in medical procedure notes uh, and use that to use medical error, uh, improve communication between healthcare providers, and also provide high quality and reliable research data for interventional radiology research. And Medical records in general has been a revolution in our lifetime. What used to be paper notes, uh, as you can see, it's not uh, very clear to read, and it's often hard to aggregate, has now become our electronic medical record and uh, even consumer-oriented uh, medical record products like Apple Health. And what this really has done has made it easier for uh, clinicians and researchers to take a bird-eye view of data and also really to analyze patient data uh, for all different kinds of purposes. Um, but again, this has been hard for uh, subjective uh, data like procedure notes because again, everyone writes their notes differently and everyone uh, writes the story differently. But it's important because there's a lot of stakeholders that can benefit from improved uh, data extraction from these medical notes. Um, not only could it help reduce medical error, which has a huge impact on our healthcare system, it can help hospitals and clinics better understand the patient population. Um, it can help clinicians better guide their clinical decisions. And it can also help researchers uh, really push the boundaries of research by uh, making uh, data generation a more easier process. So what we want to do is that uh, we wanted to build a software pipeline for doing this. So we used Python because uh, it is a scientific plat uh, coding platform that is very much supported in the community. Uh, so there's already a code that's written that you can incorporate into your own project, which makes the process easier. And it's also open source, which is what we intend for our program to be. So how we approached it first is through a very uh, simple process called keyword matching. And it's exactly what it sounds like. You basically give uh, have a list of uh, terms that you want to find and you have the computer find it for you in your notes. Uh, but as many of you can realize, uh, it doesn't really give you a good contextual clue. So it only tells you if you found something. So what we've been refining and have built into our program is to do something called natural language parsing. So in essence, you're teaching a computer to be a clinician. You're telling it, you're teaching it to uh, recognize uh, different terms and the categories they fit in and is trying to construct a relationship between these different terms. So you can see this is a small section of a um, IR procedure note. And what I highlighted is uh, the different categories each term fit in. And so the computer is trying to uh, stitch this all together and then output the final data as a very clean, very uh, clear example of what it found in uh, this note. So rather than reading this entire note and then going back over and over again to uh, find points, you ha just have a computer to do it for you, which can dramatically speed up the process and also make it uh, much more accurate. And we know this is uh, something that uh, viable because companies are doing it already. So Amazon has um, something called Amazon Comprehend Medical. And so it's uh, something that you upload your patient notes and it generates a report for you. But uh, each uh, upload that you do costs money and it can be uh, difficult to use. So uh, for um, you know, nonprofit organizations, they really have to make a decision on what, uh, you know, whether they want to use it or not. You also have uh, another example called CTAKES by um, 
Apache Software Foundation. But as you can see, it's a bit hard to configure because you need to really um, have knowledge of how to use it. So what we really wanted to do is that, and this is sort of a uh, over summary of what we're trying to do. What we wanted to do is take IR procedure notes, put them into our uh, very easy to use note parser software, and then have it turn out a organized and categorized data, not only just for one patient, but for an entire list of patient populations. And we believe it can help do all these kind of things that you see on the right um, in terms of reducing medical error and improving uh, clinical decisions. And so I think one well, of the key strengths of our project is that it's very much a feasible a project. There really is no um, large scale development needed to uh, create a technology. We have something that's uh, there already and we know it's doable because other companies are exploring the same space. But I believe our product really stands out because uh, it's ultimately the clinicians who are making the software. And that's really the key point of how uh, technology in the healthcare system sometimes fail. It's because the people who actually built the software are not the ones using it. But if that wasn't the case, if we're actually gonna use the software that you built, I believe that can make technology one of the greatest invaluable assets of our modern healthcare system. Um, with that, thank you so much for listening. All right, thank you. So next we have Shivam. See if this works. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Do you see and my you, Yes. Can you see my screen? Yep. All right. Uh, I just want to say these are some amazing presentations. Really amazing work. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Shivam Kaushik. I'm first year at Rowan SOM and. Uh, this is my presentation. It's a telescoping guide wire with a multi-lumen approach. So a little bit of background. Um, the inspiration for this concept came from uh, multiple conversations with Dr. Vatican Cherry uh, and also from a man named um, Professor Ron Alteritz. Um, his group over at UNC does multi-lumen steerable needles for bronchoscopy research. And I got to pick his brain and I thought, why can't we apply this concept to some devices in the field of IR to improve patient outcomes? Um, and also there's another man named Tom Palermo who talks about steerable guide wires for, uh, along with variable stiffness. And he has several patents on this uh, concept. So uh, without further ado, um, this is uh, pretty much the uh, design. So inequalities in medical device uh, supply in third world countries versus the U.S. are quite prominent. Um, here in the U.S., guide wires are supplied in bulk by companies like Termo and Boston Scientific, whereas in the third world countries, it's not quite the same. And one solution to reduce waste and fit the patient population along with the vasculature and the anatomy is to design a multi-lumen approach to guide wires. Um, and over here, you can see that I have this figure. So we start with a 038, inside is an 018, and then inside is an 014. So here's the proposed uh, design. So current procedures go with a needle and then into the femoral artery, and then the guide wire is inserted, and then the catheter is placed on top. Um, oftentimes, we have to keep the patient's anatomy in mind when we make the selection. So for instance, there's a change in diameter from the femoral artery to the anterior tibial, whereas here with this robust tool, we can ad adapt to the vascular tree, especially cases where there's tortuous anatomy. So if, can you see my mouse? Hello? Okay, so on this side, we have, um, this is the fully extended uh, guide wire, and here is the guide wire fully extended, and this gradient shading is a catheter that's preloaded. One of the advantages here is by preloading a catheter, we can remove, uh, reduce the risk of it infection. And um, this concept, I actually got inspired by watching a presentation on the Excelsior Striker microcatheter on which they're preloaded. And over here is pretty much the design that we that uh, I propose. We have a power supply, a ground, plus minus motor, and here is a coil. And at the base of this coil would be a rod which would insert and extend uh, the guide wire as you traverse the vasculature. And this rod would uh, sort of provide the uh, stiffness to the internal core of the guide wire 
there. And this concept is actually inspired by uh, Michael Lee's textbook in which he talks about uh, Benson variable stiffness and movable core guide wires. So some of the advantages, as mentioned, um, with this multi-lumen approach, we can traverse vascular tree, variable stiffness to really hook around and move in tortuous vessels along with the steerability aspect. Um, it's cost effective since if you buy one of these devices, you essentially have three guide wires which you can uh, engage and disengage. Um, and uh, one of the figures I found said an average cost of guide wire ranges from $64 to 257 but um, upon consultation with some representatives from Turbo, I found that this price can even go higher. Um, and as mentioned, we have three segments and one guide wire. Uh, and, and the timeline here, it would likely take seven years from, to go from concept to the market. A prototype would take six months, ideally, patent three years, lab testing six months to 12 years, then along with the FDA approval, manufacturing and distribution. And this is my presentation on uh, the telescoping guide wire uh, with the multi-lumen approach. Uh, if you like, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, so lastly, we have a team from the University of South Dakota, Stanford Mc School of Medicine. They were unable to join us for the webinar today, but they had made a video ahead of time that they would like to share. Medicine in the 21st century can reach more lives than ever. Rapid deployment to austere environments brings medicine to the front lines, but extensive, often tenuous supply chains can prevent medical equipment from arriving when and where it is most needed. 3D printing overcomes these supply chain logistics by providing rapid, flexible manufacturing. Moreover, 3D printing filament or resin can be used to manufacture countless pieces of medical equipment and is much more efficient to transport on site than individual pieces of equipment. Interventional radiology's multimodal and, at times, improvisational techniques, coupled with the field's growing frontline presence, make a prime candidate for early adoption of 3D printing technologies. The WHO states that a lack of medical supplies in austere environments, such as IV tubing, syringes, and the like, directly impacted the case fatality rate seen in situations like the 2016 Ebola epidemic and the 2020 coronavirus epidemic. On-site production of medical supplies could directly impact the outcome of epidemics like these. challenges and demonstrate the utility of on-site manufacturing, we prototyped the key components of a central venous access kit using additive printing technology. Our prototypes were designed using commercially available polymers costing under $1 in materials, and our printer cost under $300, highlighting the low-cost efficacy of 3D printing. 3D rendered designs, combined with click-and-print capabilities, permit ease of use regardless of skill level. Existing and novel printing materials, such as metal and silicone, can afford intricate designs and unique properties. As IR takes center stage in austere environments, the field must adapt to unpredictable circumstances. Imagine the ability to print a stent on site, customized to a patient's unique anatomy or print a carbon fiber microcatheter designed to navigate one specific tortuous vessel. Device shortages need not hamper 
life-sustaining care any longer. IR's inherent relationship with technology and history of innovation make it poised to lead in medical 3D printing. Today we stand at a crossroads to embrace this technology and continue as vanguards of modern medicine, or to stand idly by as others pick up the mantle of innovation. We of the Seldinger Society believe in the power of 3D printing to reshape the world of modern medicine and look to our community for the support to do so. So this concludes the bow design competition. So big shout out to all the teams that presented. There were some really amazing ideas and I really can't wait to see how they turn out. Um, also a big thank you to our guest speaker, John, for taking the time out of his busy day to talk to us. If you're interested in participating in the bow design competition next year, look out for an email from SIR regarding an opportunity to sign up. So thank you again for tuning in tonight and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.